Sunday bites and tidbits about this life, they'll help you live it and get yourself together. Sunday bites and tidbits. Hey everybody, welcome to. Go ahead, Beth, sing the song. Sunday bites and tidbits. <laughs> <laughs> it gets kind of worse each week. This week was. Last week was pretty I good. I don't know what that was, but welcome all to the show. We are so excited to have you here. What are you guys? What's going on with you ladies today? Mm. Well, I'm happy today. Why are you happy today? My daughter took me to lunch to this restaurant. I am just absolutely in love with this restaurant. It's in Manhattan Beach. It's a Chinese restaurant. Oh my God, never tasted food so delicious. This is the second time she's taken me. So I'm so thrilled. And I'll give you the name of it after we're done. We can post it, but oh my and God. And it's vegan. Food is amazing. Huh? Obviously it's vegan. No, if they have vegan options. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. Because I know most yeah. of the time you like to eat it vegan because you don't trust the vegan options all the time. Yeah, but uh, th these people are so consistent and the food is so unbelievably delish delicious. They have these garlic string beans. Oh, my God. I love garlic anyway. string beans. Anyway, so what's going on with you? Well, I have a piggyback off what Bebe just said. So I live, I live in Fort Smith, Arkansas. It's a real army fort. Like, it was a real army fort where, where soldiers came. A lot of refugees, a lot of Korean refugees, Vietnamese refugees um, from Laos and all the places. So when you, Asian food in Fort Smith, Arkansas? <laughs> it's crazy. I'm, I'm, I'm regional Asian food. Like we're gonna run out down street get some Chinese. No, it's like regional a, but bet you would lose your mind. It is so, and they just do it right in front of you. And it, right in front of you, huh? Oh my God. It's so good. Uh, Tara, you remember that place we took you to called Fuji? Yeah, the sushi, they had the okay. sushi. Yeah, and they have vegan sushi. Sweet potato sushi. What? No. Girl. No. It was so, it's so good. And they only serve it this time of year. That's why Deb got to get yeah, to. Probably because of holiday type of thing. Holiday, so good. So, that's just a shout out to, you know, Asian cuisine Asian, that we love. Asian oh, not, cuisine. Well, I, I what's that? We can't oh, talk. What did you do? What did I do? You look like you got bit. Well, one of my cats was trying to crawl up my jumpsuits in the closet. No. I didn't, I didn't appreciate that. Go figure. So I went to grab her. I'm to get sorry. Her closet, and she turned around, hooked her claw in my finger, hooked it, and then slid down my hand. No! I'm telling oh. you. I sent Mitchell a picture. I was crying like I was five. It was blood. And I, was, I wasn't crying as much because it hurt, even though it heck of hurt. I was crying because I was on my way to my first rehearsal. And you're all bloody now. But I, I found some new skin. You know that stuff you paint on? And yeah, stuff? yeah, right, right, right. You just covered it up. Yeah, well, but it, no, it was not cute. One of the reasons I have no animals. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, my, my week was, let me just share. I have, you know, I go to the food bank to help the vegan food bank every oh. week. And, we, you know, she allows us to shop. So I got a bag about this size of lentils. And I don't know why I thought it was the smaller bag. So I cleaned them and I put them all in a crock pot and I sliced up some carrots and some celery and onions. And I, you know, that was, I have so much lentil soup. <laughs> I'm like, lentil soup is coming out of my ears. Cause every morning I go, well, just eat some lentil soup for breakfast. Why not lentil soup? I've been eating lentil soup. It, the thing is full, so now I'm going to start giving some away. But, yeah, that's very exciting. That's kind of a pathetic life, if you think about it. All I have to talk about is my big crock pot. Not pathetic at all. Lentils, 
are so healthy and now you have enough that you can actually uh, put in containers and freeze. Freeze it. That's what I'm going to yes. do today. After my, but I'm just saying my life is kind of down to. Your life I'm, sounds amazing to me. I'm pausing on where you got the lentils. I'm now for free. No, not that. Food bank. Where were you there? Food bank. Yes. Gwenna, Gwenna has Vegans of LA and she helps, she gives people fresh vegetables because most food, most food banks have, um, you know, canned goods and a lot of processed food, but she, she wants to make sure people get, get healthy fresh food, fresh foods. And Real so I go down there once product. a month just to help out and it's wonderful. But yeah. I, you know what, I just want to get on our guest today because this gentleman has made some strides in, in New York and, and um, was a police officer for years. And some of the stuff that we kind of know but don't know, we guess that's going on, he wrote a book about it called The Dirty 30. And I can't wait to hear more about it because as a woman who has especially sons, I mean, or African-American kids, I'm always petrified when I hear police stories. You know, and I'd like to know from him, from being on the inside, how valid is well, what my concerns have been if I lived in New York and how valid are my concerns, period. You know, and wow. and him being a father, how did he navigate all that? Please welcome our guest, Leo Langar, Langaro. But he's, but he's got another name. And I don't know how to say it, so we're going to let him say what his full name is. Okay, Leo Lungard. Leo Lungard. Hello, how you doing? Good, how are you now? What is your full name, Leo? Is it Leo T or Leo? You mean my real first name? Yes. Laborio. You gotta, Laborio. You gotta, yeah, you got to say it like an opera singer. Laborio. 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 <laughs> <laughs> much better than me. <laughs> Anyway, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited to have you here today because, you know, we are all moms here mm -hmm. and grandparents, a couple of them. And uh, Sylvia and I have spent a lot of time in New York and um, really kind of brought you here because I wanted to hear more about your journey as a police officer and mm -hmm. also how you specifically navigated being a father, being a husband, how did you inwardly navigate the madness that you saw versus, you know, the lifestyle that you were living and how the safety of your family and other people that you knew and cared about? I know somebody told me it's kind of like being on a plane where, mm -hmm. the you know, if you have a dad or somebody who's a pilot, they can talk to you about it a different way than somebody who's petrified of flying and thinking every plane's going to fall out of the sky. Mm -hmm. So for me, being a mom, I'm petrified of police officers, number one, because of what happened to me when I first moved out here. And number two, because when you see them, a lot of times they're always, not all of them, but a lot of them are doing things that are just <sighs> not right. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your journey and your story and then the book, et cetera. Well, you know, for me, I, I love being a police officer. I come from a family of police officers, my uncles, uh, both of which were homicide detectives. My brothers, uh, one was a homicide detective, the other one was a lieutenant. Um, so taking the police test from the beginning, I always wanted to be a cop. I, the one big thing uh, in New York City, when I came on in 1979, they were very big into community policing. So from the day I graduated from the police academy, you know, we went out and did a beat. We, you met the people on the street. You see who you're working for, because really you're working for the community. And you know, it's not the other way around. Um, I don't know what's going on today, if they still follow the community policing methods. Um, but I know back then, um, I, I mean, in my world, I didn't look at it as madness. I looked at it every day getting up and going out and helping people. And that was my job, to help. And, and that's all I cared about. Did I see some ugly things? Well, yeah, I mean, I worked in a, you know, the 34th precinct, the 30th precinct. They had hundreds and hundreds of homicides per year, which is kind of crazy. But I think you have a defense mechanism that comes up that you, you kind of shut, shut it out. 
you know, because you didn't do the homicide. I mean, you witness you witnesses the bodies and see the bad things that happen. But when something ha like that happens for me, I look at the senior citizens. I look at the kids. I'll go out my following tour and I, I'll go to a subway or a bus stop where the kids are getting on the bus to go somewhere. Hey, how are you doing? Talk to the kids. Um, I'll talk to the store owners, see how they're doing. Um, and with community policing, you know who the good, good guys are and you know who the bad guys are, you know, because you're seeing the good guys every single day. And then all of a sudden you're seeing a certain change on the street corner. You see people, you know, dealing drugs or they have guns or, you know, they're just abusing, uh, you know, a loved one or something else. So you got to stand in and do your job. Um, and going home, uh, I n never took my job home until I worked in the 30th precinct when you had all that corruption going on where 30 cops got arrested. Um, and for me, the reason why I wrote this book was because one, I saw, for me, a big mis miscommunication between the police and the community. And when you have miscommunication, just like any relationship, there's going to be a problem. So I wanted people to read the book to say, hey, you know, even though 30 cops got arrested here, you had 150 cops who were good guys. And what did the good guys do to stand up to the bad guys? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you go through that anxiety, that stress, that pressure? You know, there was five suicides in a matter of three years, and I knew them all. Yeah, that hurts. Um, Are you saying there were five suicides in the police force? Yep. In yeah. my, that one precinct, the 30th precinct. Yep. You know, it's, and they were all good guys, but the pressure, there was a four-year investigation, and, you know, uh, they had to be, the 30 guys had to be arrested. There's no doubt about it. They were bad. I mean, I had arguments with sergeants fist fights with sergeants you know i went head to head nose to nose with a captain um you know you know which is hard to do when you're the sergeant and then you're going you have the authorities like you yelling at your boss you know yeah. the only thing i had was the captain was underneath the deputy inspector and the deputy inspector uh liked me a lot you know because you know, i brought this community together you know in the beginning it was very very difficult you know because they didn't trust me so I had to gain that trust over four or five years. And I also had an open door policy. So anybody in the community could come into my office any time that I was working and they trusted me. You know, it, 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 took, it took a while to gain their trust, but at the end, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me because everybody talks about police officers become cynics. When I went to the 30th precinct, I went, believe me, I went kicking and screaming. I did not want to go there. I want to go back to the detective bureau. <laughs> and why do they move you from one to the other? Um, well, one, I got promoted. So when you get promoted sergeant, you have to go back to a precinct on patrol. And then after I was supposed to go back to the detective bureau after six months, this investigation, which I didn't know what was going on, but I had kind of a clue because they said, listen, you know, I want to go for my six months to 20th precinct, which is at the Museum, Museum of Natural History, Central Park, you know, a nice place. Um, and then when they told me I was going to the 30th, I was like, okay. And then they told me you're going to be in charge of community policing. That's when I knew I was going back to the detective bureau, because once they put you in command of a unit, you're going to be there for two, three years. I ended up being there for eight years. And again, it was, um, it was probably the best thing that ever happened. Cause what I was going to mention before was everybody says that police officers become cynics you know, over the course of their career. I was blessed, and believe me, it was a blessing that I went to the 30th precinct and I actually got to work with the community, you know, face to face. And it was probably the best thing that ever happened in my life. You know, I loved the community. I loved all the people. In fact, when I was researching this book, um, I changed the name in the book, it's Miss Burnett in the book. And I went around the community, see what was going on, see how it changed and everything. And then I saw her out front, in front of a brownstone. She was sweeping you know, her sidewalk. And I came walking out. Now, you got to remember, this like 10 years later. So I went up. I said, well, I wonder if she remembers me. And I'll say to my son, you know, 
I'll feel bad if she doesn't remember me, you know? So I went up to her and her eyes got real big and she goes, oh, Sergeant Longaro. I said, how are you doing? She goes, oh, I'm fine. She goes, oh, I miss you so much. I said, oh my God. She goes, you know, I said, how's, it, how's the streets doing and everything? She goes, oh, you know what? You, you promised us change and you gave us change. She goes, you still have a couple of these idiots over here, <laughs> you know? And then she gave him a hug and a kiss on the cheek and you know, I drove my car down with the side, having oh, a tear in my eye. <laughs> um, I had a question for you. I love sure. hearing all of the facets of your career. You mm -hmm. know, Thank you. Officer. so I kind of wanted to go back a little bit. Sure. Um, you talked about your dad and, and your family. What, if you could tell, what was the thing besides the fact that it was part of your family? What was the thing in you that made you say, yeah, this is what I want to do with my life? And I would also like to know about the trajectory of your ranking and where you, what rank you were when you finally left. Mm -hmm. um, so those kind of a two, that kind of the two pronged question. Mm -hmm. I just would love to know the history of the kind of how all that happened. Well, I think, you know, for me, I always wanted to be a police officer. I, I, you know, maybe because of Beretta, Starsky and Hutch, all the TV shows, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, you know, my uncles, like I said, they were homicide detectives, but before that you have to be a patrol officer and everything else. And they would tell me the stories and, you know, again, how they help people and stuff like that. Um, so I was excited, you know, when I took the police test, you know, my uncle gave me, you know, the, the, you know, the brochure and I took the test. I did really well, I was in the first class and probably five or six years. Um, so yeah, I never, it was, a, it, it, it was an exciting moment for me when I went into the police academy, it really was. Um, and again, everything was, when I went to the academy and when I went on the street as police officer, everything was really, they ingrained in you community policing. In fact, I remember one of the instructors would say, you know, be kind to the people on the street because when you get in trouble, somebody's fighting you, shooting at you, they're the ones that are going to call 911 on the phone and help you. Um, and I think from the start, doing foot patrol, walking the beat, and really talking to people, you see how many people actually like you, um, which was very important to me because I, I was excited to be a cop and then I was excited to meet people. Well, for us, we don't like we don't know. I mean, my brother wanted to be a police officer. He decided to become a truck driver instead. But mm -hmm. but we don't know. And then the average person watching this, we don't know kind of what that looks like. You take the exam and then what happens and then what happens and then what happens? How does that go? Well, yeah, you go, you know, you take the test and you have to. Am I? I was in the first class. Um, you go into the police academy at the police academy. You do six months of um field training so you do another six so six months of it's like going to college for six months and then six months of training which is hands-on and you have a field training officer who uh is a mentor he teaches you how to do things how to work and stuff like that from there you go to a permanent command which i went to the 34th precinct which was washington, washington heights from there um, I gained a good reputation of being a good cop. Uh, I was recommended for narcotics and I got into Manhattan North Narcotics. So I did undercover work. From there, I got promoted to detective and then I went to a uh, Bronx robbery squad, which basically oh. we would do pattern robbery. So somebody had to do three or more robberies for our unit to pick it up. Um, and then I took the sergeant's test and got promoted to sergeant and then ended up in 3 <laughs> So wow, that's amazing. Well, I'm probably jumping really far ahead. However, I just wanted to share this. I <clears throat> was born in 1950. My brother was 10 years, five years older than my, no, 10 years older than myself. Mm -hmm. And we were raised on the east side of Los Angeles. Okay. Central Avenue, Washington Boulevard. My brother was always in trouble, mm -hmm. always in trouble. My mother, however, was block captain, 
She always had the police in her house. She just, mm -hmm. she was one of those love, just embrace the police. My mm -hmm. brother, however, he said there was not a time that he was ever arrested that he wasn't beaten. Not mm -hmm. one time that he was ever arrested that he wasn't beaten or mistreated. So he always took the opportunity to lash out because he knew they were going to slap him around. The mm -hmm. last time my brother was beaten by the police, they beat all the teeth out of his head. Wow. So I've had a mixed feeling mm -hmm. as it pertains to police officers, especially in neighborhoods like South Central where I grew up. I, mm -hmm. I just, uh, I didn't have a lot of trust um, for police officers. I really didn't. And I, and then I grew up during a time when I, I wanted to be a Black Panther. And so, mm -hmm. you know, my, I, I just really had very mixed emotions. I just felt like, and then I grew up with the Watts riot, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And I just always felt like because I was melanated and because I lived in a community that was highly met. Most of us were black folks mm -hmm. that um, police didn't really like us. That Now that's, that's the honest to God truth about the way that I grew up and my mm -hmm. thoughts about police officers. Mm -hmm. Did you find police officers that some of them may have been on that page? Because I realized we're just people passing tests wearing badges and packing guns. We're mm -hmm. humans and we're mm -hmm. all different. We all have different ways of thinking. What was your experience like with some of your other folks that you worked with as it pertains to a black brown community? Well, uh, that's a fair question. Um, I can't talk about Los Angeles because I was in New York City. Um, right. All I could say is I always worked in Hispanic and African-American communities. And I always got along. Um, I never saw anybody, when I worked, beat anybody or hit anybody, because that's a big no-no. I'm not going, because if I did see that, especially as a boss, I'm, I'm gonna call internal affairs and have them go to the captain's office and he'll be arrested or whatever it may be. Because again, I, I, I'm here to do a good job, help people. And I'm not here to get fired and lose my pension. You know, I, that's big. So that's the other thing, you know, wherever I worked, and I worked in really, really tough neighborhoods, tough neighborhoods, but you never put your hands on. Now, if somebody, you have to arrest somebody, they're wrestling with you, you're wrestling back, of course, you got to put the handcuffs on. So you wrestle, but once the handcuffs come on, you can't, I, I can't, I not I don't want to, I, one, I don't want to be hit in the face, you know, mm -hmm. and two, I would feel so guilty if I hit anybody. I what? mean, who has, I mean, and again, I can't talk about Los Angeles. I know there's a lot of problems and, and I'm certainly there's problems in New York too, but for the majority of the police officers that I worked with, they were good, hardworking, honest men with the exception of those 30 police officers and what they were doing, they were stealing money, drugs and everything else. Um, so can we, can we, I want to move over to that a little bit because mm -hmm. we're going to be out of time before we know it. <laughs> so what happened when you got to, to, to district 30, to precinct number 30 yeah. and you discovered how did that, like how, what, how did it, well, it, it all started because like I said earlier, I was no, supposed no, no, to... 30. 30 was where the, the bad guys were. Oh, right. dirty, dirty, dirty. 30. 30. Oh, 30. My bad. Yep. <laughs> okay, hold up 30. the book. Hold up yeah, the book. Yeah, let's see the book. I have my copy here. So oh, okay. that's the 3-0, the 30. Yeah. 30. Yes. Okay. So we want about... people to buy the book, too. Right. Yeah, we're going to promote it. So I actually went to... A couple months ago, I went to number one on Amazon for law enforcement. Nice. So I was happy about that, yeah. Nice. Um, yes. But to answer your question, like I said earlier, I wanted to go to the, tw the, tw the, tw the 20th precinct, and they sent me to the 30th precinct. And I was actually, for six minutes, transferred to the 20th precinct. And then 
a captain and his driver came to uh, my my temporary assignment was at the 32nd precinct so my six months were up and i was supposed to go to the 20th, 20th precinct 20th. and do six months there and then i was going to go back to the detective bureau a captain from the 30th precinct shows up the 32nd precinct with his driver and says come on we're going for a drive and he brought me to the 30th precinct he says oh you're being transferred here and you're taking over the community policing and i was like no i'm not he goes yes you are i said no, why why he goes i can't tell you so at that point i knew something was going on i didn't know how bad it was and then what i would do is if i knew there was certain cops that i didn't trust you know and they wouldn't do anything in front of you but what i would do i would show up unannounced at jobs and then there was one sergeant uh i caught they were the conditions team and i caught two cops inside an apartment and they said they had a job and i said what job tell me what job and then all of a sudden sergeant came in he's arguing with me i'm arguing with him and there was oh my god i would say a pound of coke so i told him put it on the scale right there and we're going to weigh that you know what no I'll put, i said no you're putting it on the scale right there we're going to weigh it and when we get back to the precinct it better be that weight or i'm going to lock you up you know so what happened when i was working they would change their hours <laughs> and then i i would change my hours just just to bust the chance but then i knew people from internal affairs you know i knew there was a big investigation going on so they were taking care of whatever they whatever they had to do you know which you know they did a good job but then in the feds the fbi uh, locked up 30 police officers wow yeah that's um and what's interesting too is when i spoke to internal in the last two three years i interviewed a lot of the cops and a lot of the dirty cops because as a writer i i can't judge i have to know exactly what happened because once i judge well then you know i'm falsifying information so um and they told me everything that was going on but when i talked to a chief from internal affairs and a detective from internal affairs uh, last year they told me that what was interesting 90 percent of the good cops was calling internal affairs on the bad cops that's you know so when i say blue you know the what's that blue wall silence i'm like there's no blue wall silence because nobody wants to get arrested they don't want to go to jail let me ask you this do you sure. find that and then i want to get back to that sir but do you find that do you still have people in the police force in new york in the who are part of it uh you mean the guys who got arrested no 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 just friends or anyone who's still oh they're the they're all retired now they're okay retired. because i'm curious to see how different things are there now than it was then it was. because it feels like a lot of times and like i can be wrong because i'm only basing it on some of the situations obviously that you see mm -hmm. on television that has me petrified right and you know and and being a, a a person of color that the stuff that i just went through mm -hmm. you know a few times with cops that you know and i you know me i came crying to you one day i thought mm -hmm. i was going to be arrested because i was working for somebody who got arrested so i was like are they gonna come get me it's like no they ain't thinking about you but i said everything i'm so nervous about it. i don't want to have anything to do with that side of the world mm -hmm. but it feels to me like a lot of and and maybe a lot is only because i see again a lot of the police officers feel like so many of them are on the wrong side we don't get to see as much of the good side of cops every now and then somebody will post something because of social media, all we get to see are the cops who are doing dirty and the cops who are hurting people and the cops who are shooting guys. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then some of my experiences out every day and even experiences with my sons, you know, mm -hmm. coming and carrying groceries into their building and being pulled over, you know, do you live here? It's like, what do we got groceries? We're mm -hmm. coming to school, we got our backpack. It just feels like all the cops now that everybody's all screwed up. I was, yeah. and I was just mm -hmm. wondering, where are the good cops how come these other people seem to just keep getting away with things um, i know it's a question for for you for you sir but i actually um have some i have something some input about that as well sarah that i'll share that i would like to share after if okay. you know. 
What are your thoughts on that, Leo? Well, my thoughts, uh, again, I, I can only talk about New York City and I can't, you know, LA, local police and stuff like that. Um, I think there's a lot of problems where I think they're going to have to get stricter in hiring yeah. the proper people. Yeah. Uh, two, the one thing I don't like in New York City, when I go back to New York City, they're all wearing these black uniforms, you know, with police on the back. They're not wearing the dress uniforms, like the blue shirts, the uniform pants, dress pants and stuff like that. I think they have to go back to being professional. They have to look professional. I, I just don't like that. You know, to me, it looks like they're more secu secu security guards than police officers. Um, when did they change the look? I don't even, I don't live in New York. I've been here 15 years, so it has had to happen in the last, you know, 15 years or whatever. Yeah. I just, I don't like that look. I don't, I think they have to be stricter on hiring. Um, uh, but when, when they're strict on hiring, as in what? What what should they be looking for that they haven't? Education, been? education, some college education, um, doing proper investigations, talking to, like when I came on, they talked to my neighbors, they went to my job, they did background search and everything else. Um, I don't know if they're still doing that, uh, but I think, I have a bachelor's degree and I put myself through college. Um, my mom probably didn't have that much money. So I had to, you know, like a lot of people, had to do it myself. Um, and I just, when I, again, I can only talk when I came on in my 20 years of service is everybody, you had a lot of veterans, you know, veterans, you know, this discipline, you know, they're in the military, yeah. you know, right? They're good. So they always got like two or three extra points, which they deserve to come on the police department. Um, I had my police test, I had a hundred on the test. Um, and everybody who took the test, I, you had to get 96 or better. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how it is anymore, but I know everybody who came on. Okay. For instance, when I took my police test, 75,000 people took the police test, 75,000. Now they can't get 2,000 people to take a police test. Really? Uh, 3, that's probably yeah. why they're, they're just grabbing people and they might have lowered the scale. Yeah, you know, I, mean, the I, I don't huh? know, but you know, I think one, again, you have to have community policing. If you don't have community policing, well then you're gonna have miscommunication the whole time, you know? Right. The police in the community have to talk like, you know, and if you see something bad on the street, now you can tell, tell a cop, hey, listen, uh, somebody smacked this, you know, kid or something like that, but you trust the cop and now the cop is going to notify, you know, right. the captain or turn right. You right. know, it's all, it comes down to trust. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, they got to get, the police department has to get better with the PR, you know? Yeah say the good things. If somebody does something bad, well, fire them. You know, that's it. You know, you, you, you're, helping all the, you're helping all the police officers by firing them because you have one bad apple. Yeah, and, and it's not just the police, it's the media. I mean, it's their job to divide us because mm -hmm. you can divide, you can keep us divided and keep us with an us and them mentality and you can break down the system. Weakening the system gives those who want that, that power the power because we're, right. we're divided. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this is what I was going to say. I'm excited to share this because this is, we talk about wellness on this podcast. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about this. So I, I told you I have a friend. Her name is Jen Lackard. Jen Lackard is, she's a black woman. Mm -hmm. She is the country's first deputy commissioner for special, deputy commissioner for special initiatives in uh, Mount Vernon. Oh, really? Yep. Okay, I know Mount Vernon. Uh, Deb, you're, or Tara, you're going to love this. She oversees the development of strategies for police reform, mm -hmm. behavioral health, and wellness wow. mm -hmm. for both the officers and the community. Mm -hmm. Policy procedures and implementation of the new Civilian Complaint Review Board and the reentry support for formerly incarcerated persons. And they've also implemented something called the KQ. It's a kindness quotient kind of exam thing that you take the way you would take an IQ test. 
and the police are taking it and it's it, it's become kind of a thing um but that's happening in mount Vernon, new york right now wow mm -hmm. And well, that's a big deal for me to me. That's a big deal. That is a big deal. But um, well, look at this. It says, uh, I would just pull this up. It says, um, pass the personal qualification for a police test. 70, a score of 70 if applying for the Los Angeles Police Department. 70 mm -hmm. is the score that you have to pass. Wow. So, and it says, and if you fail, you can retake the test in six months. Mm -hmm. Wow. What was your retake ratio to when you failed? Do you remember, Leo? Yeah, you had to, you, you had to get a 95 or better. Yeah, but you to when did you retake the test? Oh, well, the test is like every one to two years, so you won't have to worry about six months. I, I don't know how wow. they do it now, but back then. Well, that's then, what it's saying here. You can retake the test in six months. But that's L.A. That's, that's LA. LA. right. So, yeah, and, right. I mean, and what we're talking about here is in New York, so I'm excited about that too. I want Leo, I want you to know about that because she's somebody you should probably know anyway. Mm -hmm. But wellness, there have is a wellness component in the police yeah, department. But I, I still want to go back to the book again because what is amazing to me that you weren't you a little nervous, like that writing this book. I know, you know, because. Yeah, you were not concerned, or is it that everyone was retired, and even if they wanted to come after you, they couldn't? No, no I mean, I knew everybody personally. Um, even the dirty 30 people? <laughs> yeah, I went head to head with them, I'm fighting with them yeah. every day. Um, but originally, when I first came out here with my daughter Amanda, I wrote a pilot um, and a feature film before I wrote the book. Um, and then when I decided to write the book, Pandemic, um, I said, you know what, let me try and write a book. Let me see what happens. But again, I, I said, I can't judge, so I have to start reaching out to these dirty cops. So I reached out to the dirty cops, and I wanted to know why they did it and how it happened. And that's another thing I wanted to put in the book, why and how. So other cops, young cops, know if they have a boss that's trying to lead them down the wrong path that they can say no you know there are other options and one of the biggest problems were the sergeant who i went head to head a lot um he would take these rookies and work their own hours so he, they weren't working with the regular patrol officers or anything else like that for instance if it's a fresh platoon, it's like day tours, or doing seven to threes, and then my team's doing 10 to sixes, he would have his team do two o'clock in the afternoon to 10. Mm. So you, and he'll take them out on their own, so they're not really going with the veteran officers or other things, and now the sergeant's tell them to do one thing, and now they do one thing, now all of a sudden, oh, I got you, so now you have to continue doing this. And it just kind of snowballed. Uh, with some of these younger cops. And, and I'm sorry, I'm a little lost. So the sergeant was corrupt. Oh, yeah. He got yeah. arrested. And so he would, okay, so then he would take these veterans, and now once they do it one time, he's oh, no, got rookies. No, the I rookies. Mean, I'm sorry, rookies. Sorry, yeah. the rookies. Sorry, yeah. the rookies. He would the, take the rookies, and once he gets them to do something one time, they're stuck. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's wow. snowballed. Right. Yeah. Um, the and, culture of fear supported that. Mm -hmm. it, it, it didn't even have to be a direct threat. You just knew yeah, that you and, could do this. And now I got you. So mm -hmm. now. And they were 30. That, that's a huge number. Yes. The 30. Like, like, so what kind of things are we talking about? Like, besides drugs or maybe stealing money? What? That's, that's what they were doing. That's they, what they were doing. Pretty they're, like, they're like drug dealers and. To find out where a stash house was, and they'll kick in the door, take the money, and Got it. The drugs, and sell the drugs, and um, yeah, it's wow. you know, it, it, wow. it's yeah. So they they basically were just drug dealers with uniforms. Yep. Mm -hmm. Can I segue to something kind of completely off, but kind of on? You know, you mentioned that you've written a pilot. 
mm -hmm. and feature. And and obviously you're out, you know, you're in LA and you're mm -hmm. very familiar with that world. Uh, do you do any um, consulting work on on films or series or procedurals to make sure they're getting it right when it comes right. to the way they portray the police? Yeah. Uh, no, no. Um, yeah, that yeah, you probably because you 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 know it from all you know it from so many years and from mm -hmm. inside outside all you know you know it from so many different from different places. It seems that that would be something that you would be a great resource for to make sure something was accurate. You know, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm sure. I mean, I'm I'm more interested in getting a television series or a feature film out. That's the reason why I wrote the book. And right yeah. now, I'm writing. A, believe it or not. I'm writing a prequel to the 3-0. Wow, that's because, good. Because I, when I interviewed everybody, internal affairs, feds, detectives, uh, cops, and everything else, I actually found out how the whole investigation started. Wow. And the, and the reason why I went to the 3-0. Wow. I didn't find this out until I talked to the chief last year. He goes, Leo, remember that case in Robbery Squad with the 13 uh, impersonation? Uh, robberies i said yeah i said that was my case he goes yeah that's how it all started wow. i said you serious wow that's, that made know. sense why they put me to the 3 -0. you know <laughs> i didn't find out till a year ago though yeah because you said that when he picked you up at the 2-4 or the 2-0 that yeah, he three, said <laughs> come on you you'll know when you get there wow when you got there and, and 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 so he specifically handpicked you because he knew that you are the type of guy, you're a good guy, you're a clean guy, and you're gonna make, you're not gonna let it slip under the rug. Nope. And the other thing that amazed me too is a lot of the good cops from the 3 L who are now retired, 10 of them came forward and told me that they were actual undercover informants for the internal affairs and the feds. Oh. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, oh my God. So if anybody was doing something bad, they you were getting caught. You were getting yeah. Wow. That's amazing. That's wow. So did what that, did they need you for? Oh, that's funny. How did you navigate that in your head though, Leo? You seem like a man with a lot of a lot of joy. And you mentioned the word kindness earlier. That's mm -hmm. that's a big that's a big deal. I love that word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love kindness. But you mentioned that. And so how did you navigate just keeping your head and your heart right? Not just while you were going through it, but stuff like that leaves residue. You know, well, how do you, how did you, how do you, and how did you navigate that? Well, again, the most important thing for me, being a boss at the 30th precinct, is to protect my men and women, my team, first and f foremost. I wouldn't let them go near any of the dirty cops or the sergeants or anybody else. I protected them. The second thing was the community, you know. I had to protect, protect the community. And I'll give you a perfect example. The ministers of Harlem, okay, when all the police officers got arrested, the 30 of them, Reverend Ruth O'Neill, actually I got the plaque right up there, came with two busloads of children from the local school and they all made handwritten thank you cards. Oh. So instead of coming to the precinct, you know, <laughs> having a riot and everything else, they came in and her and the ministers of Harlem came in and uh, gave us these thank you cards and gave me a plaque, a trophy, and, you know, really nice. And, uh, you know, it, that was a touching moment. It was a touching yeah. moment. You so know, that I community, always liked you too. I knew you were a good guy. <laughs> I like you too. <laughs> and, but I think that's, you know, because, and it was not just me, but my team, and most of the cops, the good cops in the Frio, were able to gain the community's trust that they knew who we were. You know, there was no miscommunication. And I think that's, that's the biggest thing about my book, and I think the biggest problem with policing today, you know, in my mind, and then I, I could be wrong, but I think it's miscommunication. And I think everybody has to get back on the same page and work a little harder. And the police works for the community. The community doesn't work for the police. 
And I think that's, that's, you know, that's hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, what you said was you talked about that moment, what the children did, they yeah. expressed kindness toward you. And it's the funny thing about that is that when they did that for you, it activated that feeling in you, mm -hmm. you know, the oxytocin and the dopamine and the endorphins and all that good feeling. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's funny because if somebody, when you shared that with someone, just when you shared it with mm -hmm. us, felt it too. Yes. And that's mm -hmm. what happens with, with the, if you talked about that. If you're kind to these folks, mm -hmm. not nice, but kind to them, mm -hmm. if you need them, which you will if you're out there on the street as, mm -hmm. as a police officer, they're going to remember that kindness. Yep. They remember that they could trust you and you made them feel safe. And mm -hmm. I think it's a beautiful thing. So, yes, you did answer the question. Um, yeah. And, and, and a lot of people I went through, believe it or not, during this whole thing, panic attacks. Mm. So I remember one time I was behind my desk and I got, I was upset because the dirty sergeant tried to grab one of my officers and I flipped out. And then I talked to my officer. I said, listen, I don't care. You call me. If I'm home, you call me. I don't care. I'll come in. You do not go out with that guy. I don't care if it's an order, whatever. And uh, I just remember the, my whole office started spinning and spinning. Oh. And then I, I could, and I didn't want, I didn't want my team to see me weak. Oh. So I had a, I was hugging the walls, getting back to the locker room, into the bathroom, just so I could sit and, you know, breathe, you know, like I've cut my hands like this, you know? So a lot of people went through panic attacks during this, this, you know, this time. And what, know? what, what was the panic of that, that something was going to happen to people? Because that's my you know, no, I think it just everything was just everything, yeah. collapsing, and you know, and the other thing too is, you want to help everybody. You want to help everybody, and there's only so much time in a day, you know, that you could be doing things and everything else. So now, not only am I trying to protect my team, and the good officers, you know, 150 other officers in the precinct who are good, I also want to protect the community you know, away from, you know, these dirty cops and everything else, even though they were more into the drugs and the guns and everything else. Uh, it just, you, you know, your mind just, it, it adds up at, over the course of How time. did you deal with it? How did you deal with the panic attacks? And how did you do, you said there were several people who were experiencing that. Mm -hmm. How did you get yourself back? Medication. Then? Okay, mm -hmm. wow. Medication. Yeah, you know? amazing. That's good. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was scary. I was, I, am I having a heart attack or am I having a brain tumor or something like that? It was, it was yeah. freaky, you know? Um, did it, did mm -hmm. it ever, the fear, because you being a family man and loving husband, you know, been with uh, your wife, Wendy, for years, and you have three beautiful kids, it never spilled over to your concern for your children? No, I think every police officer knows the job you know and it could be dangerous and you know, our job is to protect people you know so when somebody's firing a gun we can't run the other way we have to go towards that gun because not only you know i'm protecting people on the street the community but i'm also protecting other police officers from, from being hurt so do i did i ever think about you know i was gonna be i mean i've been cut you know, I've been stabbed, but do I ever think about I'm not coming home today? I don't think, I, you know, I, and I think most police well, police officers like that. I don't, you can't live in fear. If you live in fear, oh. then you, you can't be a, you're not going to do your job. Well, I'm not even talking about you living in fear for you. I'm mm -hmm. saying as a parent, because when you see, well, let me put it back on me. Mm -hmm. When I see so much of this going on with, you know, police in the world and, and the violence, be, probably because I have a very hard time separating, it's not very good for me to be mm -hmm. able to, because then I just, all I do is worry about every time my sons leave or my daughter leaves the house mm -hmm. because, yeah, you know how to train yourself and mm -hmm. then, but your kids may not. And because of seeing so much corruption and seeing so much violence on a regular basis, it's never concerned you with your kids. And if it did, how did you navigate that? Um, I think it depends where you live and where you brought up and the media. Um, I didn't, 
you know, once I became a cop, I didn't live in the city. I lived in the suburbs. So mm -hmm. it's a lot different. It's not like everybody's on top of each other. And you got to remember also, back in the day, you didn't have the social media that, that you have today. Yeah. I mean, that's big. So I just tell my kids, you know, uh, I mean, if they were brought up in Washington Heights or, you know, somewhere in the city, yeah, I would have, I'd probably have some concerns with everything going on today, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the other thing, too, is when I worked, you know, again, everything was ingrained with community policing. So uh, even Washington Heights, everybody knew their beat officer, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, like my wife, Wendy, she knew the local police officer, Sal. He would walk the beat, you know, talk to everybody and everything else. So they were more comfortable. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I'd probably be. You know, if my kids were brought up in the city, I think I would be, probably be a little more concerned. Uh, so now that your kids are here in L.A., and even though they're not kids, they're still, you know, they're young adults for the most part. Mm -hmm. You're concerned with seeing the L.A. police officers with your children. Or do, like I was saying earlier, do you have a certain sense of um, comfort because you, you know, like the pilot of a plane has different understanding of the of that world than the average person, you know, who's riding. Who's well, yeah, I mean, my oldest son got stopped um, and his friends two or three times in, uh, I want to say Sherman Oaks, I want to say. Um, and I just, you know, I, I tell them, I said, you know, just be respectful, don't argue, um, and leave it at that. You know, they disrespect you, let me know, and I'll take a ride to, you know, the local precinct and have a conversation with them. Um, uh, yeah, so no, I mean, again, I think it's also, you know, Matthew, like Matthew's the same age as your two, mm -hmm. and, uh, but no, nah, I, I don't, you know, I don't, you know, but yeah, I think maybe my background, I think it's because of my yeah. background. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I, I want to speak to something Babette said earlier about kind of the, Mm, the the not opposing forces, but the two different kinds of ways mm -hmm. of seeing the police from her mom's perspective mm -hmm. and then her brother's perspective. And mm -hmm. I have um, a very interesting perspective as well. I have been harassed mm -hmm. to once in Illinois at a mall. I was snatched. I was ten years, thirteen, years old, and I was snatched. Um, out of the middle of the mall, I was just walking around shopping. My whole, mm -hmm. my whole family were there. We were my parents let us separate with our little mm -hmm. money and go buy our own things. Mm -hmm. And so, so before you know, cell phones were weren't the way they are now. Right. So um, they snatched me, put me in a room. I was thirteen. Mm -hmm. They put me in a room and they start screaming at me and swearing at me and calling me N word and B word and all these things. Mm -hmm. And they just went in on me. Mm -hmm. The reason they did it was because some woman had just robbed a jewelry store. And they had determined that mm -hmm. I was that woman. I was 13. You're 13. Mm -hmm. and so and and so it was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. Mm -hmm. It imprinted on me in a way that is difficult to describe. It was because there was one black one and one white one, and they were just screaming and yelling. Mm -hmm. Now the black guy wouldn't call me names, but he was rough with me. Mm -hmm. Um what finally I said, can I call? I kept saying, can I call my mom? Can I call my mom? Can I call my mom? Mm -hmm. And so um, they, I don't know if they paged them or whatever. Mm -hmm. they, they, showed, they wouldn't let them see me. Mm -hmm. And after about, I, in my 13-year-old brain, this was a really long time, but it probably might have been 30 minutes. They literally <laughs> opened the door and pushed me out the door. And come to find out, the woman they were looking for was like, Back back then, this was a grown up to me. Mm -hmm. She was like a thirty year old white woman, mm -hmm. and I, and they never apologized, and they never said anything or did anything. Well, my parents are very proactive. My mother was an educator, mm -hmm. and my father owned a construction mm -hmm. company. You know, and and they were proactive. So they mm -hmm. went after you know they went after him. Conversely, my youngest son. I'll go very quickly. Is everybody knows that my youngest is on the spectrum. Um, and but he doesn't look like he's on the spectrum. He got lost one day, had wandered off, and this young white police officer in Georgia 
found him, walked him, brought him back to the house, cared for him, loved him, and took care of him, and brought him back to me. So mm -hmm. still, I have very, you know what I mean? It's like, it's very, you know what I mean? And so, Babette, I totally feel you. Because my brothers mm -hmm. have been pulled over many, many, many times driving the nice car daddy bought them in the wrong neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, but you have both. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so we, I so appreciate you being here and your perspective. I'll stop talking now, but I just wanted to. But that's what the book is about, Dirty 30. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you got all these great cops. Yep that's doing their job protecting and caring for the community. And then you got the dirty 30 that's just like, whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, we get it. It's just, they're just people. Yeah. And it's before we wind down and, and ask you, you know, to we got to stop. Yeah. We got to stop. Um, Cause we only have 30 minutes. But the other thing was that these guys came in, probably came in, like you said, to do a good job, these rookies. And because they were with one corrupt person, figured out how to manipulate them, mm -hmm. you know, and, and get them caught up. So now they don't know what to do to get out. And there's, you know, there's so many situations like that where you prey on the weak or you prey on the non-knowing. And it takes people like you, Leo, to, and that's why they stuck you there. They were like, put Leo in it. He don't back <laughs> down. He was yelling at his, his, his superiors. He's not going to back down from anyone. And he's going to clean this up. It takes people like you and, you know, we hope that others are out there who will not just sit back and watch, you know, there's a big case going on at this moment. We all know that's all over the news of, you know, uh, 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 with the rapper gentleman and all the people who watched, you know, mm -hmm. all the people who were part of it and I'm too afraid to say something. So it's, you know, and, and, and I can't say if I was in that situation, what I would do, but I think it, because you were there and you knew and you saw and you were bigger than it was important to you to be better, that it made a big difference in in them getting caught. And so I applaud you. I mean, oh, thank you. It's, it's very nerve wracking to be that person, but you were. So what we know that you have the prequel to that book. When is that due? When is that coming out? Uh, hopefully in the near future. Maybe two months, three months. Oh, that near. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the near future, a year, three years, I don't know. No, <laughs> no, not three so, years. Leo, you've written these two books and all these other things. If you had to write a book about your life, if it was just about if this last week, whatever your life was this week, last month, or your last year, the, the previous year, what would the name of a book be if it were just a book about Leo and what Leo's life has been in the last year or two years or two months? Well, the thing that comes to right away is kindness. Oh, that yeah. is like the best. Yay! That that that's nice. Leo, I'm going to introduce you to Jennifer, Jen Lackert, out there in in, uh, in New York. Okay. Mm -hmm. where you guys need to know each other. Okay, um, great. That's exciting. That's exciting. Well, I just have one one last thing to say. You know, when you talk about where people are and how they can get sucked into something, there was a time I smoked crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. You couldn't pay me to do that today. So it's where we are, you know, uh, mm -hmm. consciously where we are. Wow. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for changing the community in New York and being, and thank you for sharing your time with us. And guys, make sure you go out and I'm going to put the book in here so you can go out and get the book and a link to it. And, mm -hmm. you know, and be, be on the lookout for his next book. Cause then you can kind of read this one and go and see now, how did all this happen? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's so important that we see, you know, sometimes the people that who do bad things, where they came from and what happened to them, we can have mm -hmm. a certain amount of, um, empathy for them probably mm -hmm. but anyway we want to thank you for thank tuning you. in and thank you for mm -hmm. joining us and as we always say before we go and we want you to join in too nobody can do you better than you well, nobody, thank you nobody can do you better than you mm -hmm. nobody can do you better than you go ahead mister Oh, me? I have to remember That's that? Right. That's right. Said I have to say remember it again? that. Nobody can do you better than you. Nobody can do you better than you. There you go. Close. You got it. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next time. And make sure you follow us. 
and follow Leo and support his book. Go out and get it and be a part of sharing kindness in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. All right, have a great day.